Hi and welcome, my name is Lon. In this tutorial, we are going to focus on C-sharp methods. Please subscribe, it's free and can help blast you through to the next level of programming and technology. And please hit the bell icon so that you can be notified of future content which will be coming soon. In C Sharp, you can implement named methods or anonymous methods. Anonymous methods will be discussed in an upcoming tutorial. This tutorial will focus on named methods. So, what is a method? A method is a block of code that is comprised of a series of statements. When a method is called by a program, the statements within the method are executed. In C-sharp, all instructions are performed in the context of a method. The main method is the entry point for all C-sharp applications. The main method is called by the common language runtime when the program is started. So we are going to create a code example that will focus on how methods are implemented in C-sharp. The theme of this code example will be a document management system. So the code we are about to create will allow a user to search for a document within a data structure containing document objects. If the document is found, code that simulates downloading document content from a web service will run and the content of the document will be displayed on the console screen. We of course cannot create a document management system in one tutorial. So this certainly is not a real-world application and must be accepted merely as a vehicle for highlighting important concepts associated with C-sharp methods and how these concepts manifest in C-sharp code. Methods are declared in either a class or a struct. We are going to define our method within classes in this example. Both classes and structs will be explored in more detail in upcoming tutorials. Very basically, a class can be thought of as a prototype or template for an object that gets instantiated at runtime through the use of the new keyword. Methods are defined within classes and can be used to implement custom behaviors for objects. This solution currently contains one project based on the .NET Core console application project template. We are going to create another project in this solution that will be based on the class library project template to implement our document management system API. This API will contain code to simulate basic document management system functionality, like for example, storing a data structure containing document objects in memory, as well as facilitating search functionality. So let's create the document management system API project. So in order to do this, we right click the solution node in our solution explorer window, select the add new project context menu item, the Add New Project dialog box will be presented. Select the Class Library .NET Core project template, which can be found under the Visual C Sharp .NET Core section. In the Name field, let's type the project's name. Let's call this project Document Management System API. And then let's click the OK button to confirm our intention to create a new project based on the Class Library .NET Core project template. You can see that by default a class named Class1 has been created for our new project. Let's right click the node representing this class and select the Delete Context menu item. Let's add a new class by right clicking the node representing the project that we have just created. Then select the Add New Item Context menu item. A dialog box with the text Add New Item followed by the name of the relevant project will be presented. Let's select the class item which is under the Visual C Sharp Items section. In the name field, let's type the text document, which will be the name of the class we are adding to the Document Management System API project. So the document class is going to serve as the base class for all documents in our Document Management System API project. We don't want this class instantiated into an object directly, so we are going to make this class an abstract class. 
So let's type the abstract keyword before the class keyword, and this class will be public. So we'll also include the public keyword preceding the abstract keyword. What is an abstract class? An abstract class is a special type of class that cannot be instantiated. An abstract class is designed to be inherited by subclasses that either implement or override its methods. So the first method we are going to add to our abstract class is an abstract method. An abstract method is a method that forces a derived class, i.e. a class that inherits from an abstract class, to implement code for the abstract method. So our abstract method is used for the purpose of forcing a class that inherits from this abstract class to provide custom code to validate a document ID. So we'll name this method is doc ID valid. And as part of this abstract method definition, one parameter of the integer data type is included. So we'll name this integer parameter ID. Preceding the method name in the method definition is the bool keyword. This means that any implementation of the abstract method must return a value of the Boolean data type. So an abstract method is ideal for explaining the concept of a method signature. Why is this? Because abstract methods contain no logic implementation. Abstract methods literally represent method signatures to which the method that implements the code logic for the relevant abstract method must adhere. For example, the isDocID valid abstract method means that a derived class must implement a method named isDocID valid that accepts one argument of type integer and returns a value of type boolean. So let's break down method signatures. A method signature comprises of the access modifier at the beginning of the method definition, followed by the optional keywords like, for example, sealed or abstract. The sealed keyword means that a method in a derived class cannot override the sealed method. A keyword denoting the return data type of the method is then included. If the method does not return a value, the void keyword is used to denote this. The name of the method will then follow. Then empty brackets follow the method name if the method does not have any parameters. If the method does have parameters, these must be included within brackets and separated by commas. A parameter will be represented by the C-sharp data type of the parameter followed by the name of the parameter. So the terms parameter and argument are seemingly used interchangeably when talking about methods in C-sharp. They do in fact have different meanings. The method definition specifies the names and types of any parameters that are required. When calling code calls the method, it provides concrete values called arguments for each parameter. Access to a method in a class can be restricted through access modifiers. Please see the previous tutorial part 14 of this course entitled C-Sharp Encapsulation for further details on access modifiers in C-Sharp. Methods can have the following access modifiers denoted by the following keywords or keyword combinations. Private, public, internal, protected, protected internal, or private protected. A method can return a value defined as a C-sharp data type in a similar way to a public field of a class. The obvious difference is that a method contains statements within its body and uses the return keyword to return a value. The return keyword within a method immediately terminates the code execution within that method and returns control back to the calling code. A method can be written in a way where it does not bear the responsibility of returning a value, but merely implements one or more statements. A method is called on an object like a field, but a method name, when called on an object, will be followed by either empty brackets if the method has no parameters, or brackets containing one or more parameters delimited by commas. So I want to add an enum outside this class, but within the same namespace where the document class resides. This enum is named document metadata format and contains three enumerator list items, namely JSON, XML, and CSV. This enum will be included as a parameter for the next method we are going to implement. Let's first create the constructor of this class. A constructor appears like a method without a return type, but a constructor is different. 
A constructor is essentially used for the purpose of initializing an object when it is instantiated from a class at runtime. Like a method, it can be overloaded and can have parameters. So this constructor will accept one parameter defined as the integer data type, which will be the ID of the document. The constructor must have the same name as the class in which it resides. So before we implement the code for the constructor, we are going to create a private method that implements the validation of the document ID. We can safely assume that the code for the isDocID valid abstract class has been implemented. We can call this code implementation using the this keyword from the abstract class. So we are essentially calling the code from whichever subclass has implemented the abstract method. The this keyword refers to the object instantiated from the derived class, i.e. the class that implements the abstract base class. So if the document ID is valid, we want to call a web service to get metadata pertaining to the relevant document. We are going to fake this by hard coding the metadata values. We are going to create private member variables to store the ID, name and description of the document. These variables will store the metadata returned from the imaginary web service. So let's implement the code for the constructor. Let's then encapsulate our private member variables and read only public properties. Let's create our second method for this abstract class. This method is named GetSerializedDocumentMetadata. The method implements logic to consolidate the metadata for the document, i.e. the ID, name and description of the document into a chosen text format, which is denoted by an argument passed into this method. The document metadata format enum is the data type for this parameter. The calling code can choose to receive the consolidated metadata in JSON, XML, or CSV format. For this example, we are only going to implement code for the CSV format. So the return text will contain each metadata field delimited by a comma. And notice that the get serialized document metadata method contains the virtual keyword in its definition. Unlike a method that contains the abstract keyword as part of its method signature, where any derived class must implement code for the abstract method, a method within an abstract class that contains the virtual keyword as part of its definition means that a derived class does not have to implement custom code for this method, but is optionally able to override the virtual method. So let's add another class and we'll call this class DMS document. The DMS document class will inherit from the document abstract class. So we use the colon character followed by the document class name to inherit from the document abstract class. So let's create the constructor for this class. It accepts one argument, which is the document ID. We can pass this value to the abstract class's constructor by adding the base keyword and the name of the parameter, ID. Code within the base class constructor can then make the relevant fake web service call and store the returned metadata results. So let's override the isDocID valid abstract class. You can see we are using the override keyword to do this. The logic is kept very simple for this example. We are saying that the document ID for the DMS document is valid if it falls between 1 and 1000. So let's then create a constant of the string data type and set its value to the text DMS document. Let's then override the virtual method named get serialized document metadata within our abstract document class. We'll call the base method and concatenate our string constant to the text returned from the base counterpart method. This code is forcing the data to only return metadata in CSV format. So the next class will represent the document management system itself. This class is going to be kept very simple. So we want to create a method that implements code to create a new document in the document management system. And the method must return a Boolean value representing if the new document has been successfully created in the document management system. We also want to return the newly created document ID if the new document has been created successfully. So how can we possibly do this? We need to return two values from the method. In C-sharp, we are able to pass value types 
like, for example, integers, to a method by reference. This means that when an argument is passed to a parameter that is marked as ref, and the value of the argument is changed within the method, the change to the variable passed into the relevant parameter by reference is reflected after the method is called from the calling code. This is similar to what happens with a reference type variable, for example an array, but this is not the same thing. The ref keyword essentially allows a value type variable like for example an integer to behave as though it were a reference type. Unlike a reference type that stores a pointer to its data that resides in a memory location on the heap, a value type variable passed by reference to a parameter is still pointing to a location on the stack, but it points to the same stack location where data for the value type variable passed by reference to the method is stored. So let's pretend that this method calls a web service to implement the codes to create a new DMS document in the document management system and returns the ID of this new document to the calling code. We'll hard code the value of 8 to represent the document ID of the newly created document. And we return the boolean value which will be true if the web service call returns a value above 0. OK, let's test this code from our main method within the document management system.net core console application project. First we need to add a reference to our document management system API class library project. So click the dependencies node under the document management system project node, then select the document management system API checkbox in the reference manager dialog box. Then let's include the using document management system API directive below the using system directive. This means that we can now directly refer to the members of the Document Management System API namespace within the Document Management System project without needing to include the Document Management System API namespace every time we refer to one of its members in code. So let's make sure the DMS class is public. Let's then instantiate an object from the DMS class by using the new keyword. Okay, so now let's test the create document method. We must make sure that we define an integer variable in the main method to pass by reference to our parameter marked with the ref keyword. This is so that we can retrieve the new document ID from our calling code in the main method once the new document has been created. Notice how we are using the method itself as a condition in the if statement. This is because we only want to execute a certain code if a new document is successfully created. If a new document is successfully created, the method will return true, which means the if condition will return true. So we are going to write the integer variable passed in by reference to the create document method to the console screen. Let's test the code. And this demonstrates the use of the ref keyword successfully. The id variable's value has been changed within the create document method from 0 to 8 and this change has been propagated through to the calling code. Let's go back to our DMS class and overload our create document method. So what does overloading mean? It essentially means we can name a method with the same name as an already existing method that exists in the same class. For example, we want to implement creating a new document slightly differently, but essentially the code is creating a new document just like a method that already exists. This essentially gives the developer a choice when creating a new document as to which create document method should be used for this purpose. So let's say in our new create document method, we want to return the ID through the return keyword in the method and not by reference through an argument. Let's also say that the description field is not a mandatory field needed for creating a new document, so this version of the create document method will accept only one parameter, the name parameter. So we can create a method with the same name as the already existing create document method to overload the create document method. But the rule for overloading a method is that these two methods with the same name must have a different method signature. Note that for method overloading, the return type is not considered as part of the method signature. Also note that when dealing with delegates, which is beyond the scope of this tutorial, the return type is considered as part of the method signature. 
So we'll keep the logic in this code very simple and simply return the ID value, which is hard coded to a value of eight. So let's call this overloaded method from the main method. And the result is as expected. So I'm going to create a class named DMS document BST. The purpose of this class is to convert an ordered array of document IDs into a binary search tree data structure containing document objects. The binary search tree data structure is beyond the scope of this tutorial, so I'm going to implement this class fairly quickly. The reason I've decided to include the binary search tree data structure in this tutorial is because many of the algorithms used to create and traverse the binary search tree data structure implement recursive code. This is basically when a method calls itself. Please download the code from GitHub to go through it at your own pace. Details of where you can download the code are below in the description. So structuring code in a binary tree configuration can result in a greater performance when searching for a particular key value within the data structure. So here's an array of key values stored in an integer array that we can configure the same data in a binary tree data structure. What makes this a binary tree data structure? A binary search tree is a node-based binary tree data structure which has the following properties. The left subtree of a node contains only nodes with keys lesser than the node's key. The right subtree of a node contains only nodes with keys greater than the node's key. The left and right subtree each must also be a binary search tree. So the advantage of configuring the data in a binary search tree over, for example, storing the same data in an array can be explained with an example like this. If we were searching for the value of seven in the array, each item in the array data structure needs to be tested against the search criteria, which is the key value of seven. So this means the code in this case will perform seven checks before finding the matching value in the array. Now if we performed the same search against the same data but the difference is that the data is configured as a binary search tree, the value of 7 will be found with only 3 checks. Obviously because we only have 7 elements in this example, the performance difference would be negligible, but if we had millions of elements, this could result in a huge performance improvement. So in terms of implementing searching functionality, the time complexity can be hugely reduced when implementing search functionality on data configured as a binary search tree data structure. Understanding binary search trees is beyond the scope of this tutorial. Let's implement the DMS document BST class. The sorted array to BST method takes a sorted integer array which in this example is an array of document IDs and then creates a binary search tree configuration. The binary search tree data structure will store document objects. Each document object contains an ID key value representing the document ID. Code can traverse a binary search tree in the following orders, pre-order, in-order, post-order and level order. A method named create in order document list is created to implement an in order traversal of the binary search tree. Note that this method populates a list named documents as it traverses the binary tree data structure. You can see that this method calls itself recursively. Essentially, the documents list will be populated in ascending order based on the document's IDs. So if you are not familiar with binary search trees, you may wish to take time to familiarize yourself with these algorithms at your own pace. These algorithms are not the focus of this tutorial. In this tutorial, these algorithms serve to show how methods in C-sharp can call themselves recursively to perform a specific function. Here is a more simple example to explain recursion. 
This method simply multiplies a value passed into it by a multiplier, which is also passed into this method. The third parameter is a value representing a limit on how much the x value can be incremented. So this is a pictorial representation of how this recursive method works. So each thread for an application is allocated a fixed amount of memory called a stack. A recursive method will call itself until the base case if condition returns true. And you can see that the first line of code in this method is an if statement. This is known as the base case. The repeat multiply method will be called recursively until the x value exceeds the value stored in the limit variable. So let's test this recursive functionality. And the result is as expected. The x value is first equal to 1 when it is passed into the repeat multiply method in the main method. The repeat multiply method then recursively calls itself until the x value exceeds 4000. So what happens if we omit the base case? memory space allocated for the stack is exceeded by the data occupied by this recursive process. As a result, a stack overflow runtime error is thrown. This is why it is important that an appropriate base case is included in a method that implements recursive functionality. So we can achieve the same functionality without implementing recursion through the use of a while loop. This is arguably easier to read. And as you can see, this code produces exactly the same result. So I'm going to implement the rest of the code for the DMS document BST class quickly. As already stated, it is not important to understand binary search trees for this tutorial. C-sharp methods are the focus of this tutorial. So we have now created the level order and in order traversal algorithms. Within the in order algorithm, document objects are added to a list named documents. Please don't be concerned in this tutorial about the algorithm details used to traverse the binary search trees. All we need to be aware of is that a list, which is just another way in c -sharp to store a collection of items, has been populated in ascending order based on the document's document IDs. We are now going to write code that returns each item in the documents list to calling code through a method using the yield return keyword combination. So this method returns an I enumerable list of document objects. The yield return keyword combination coupled with the I enumerable generic return type allows for a loop to be implemented within a method whereby when an individual item in a collection is returned to the calling code, the position of the item in the collection is remembered and subsequent calls to the method will result in the traversal of the list to resume at the last position. So we can now create a DMS document BST object in our main method and call the get ordered document list. Notice how the get ordered document list method can be used as though it were a collection by using the for each loop. So let's overload the get ordered document list method by adding another get ordered document list method that accepts a boolean value as an argument, and when the boolean value is true, it will return the items in the documents list in reverse order. Let's test the code. And this is an expected result. So I now want to demonstrate how we can make a method asynchronous. We are going to go through this quickly as the concept of asynchronous programming is beyond the scope of this tutorial. The reason for implementing asynchronous methods is so as not to block the main UI thread when a task 
that needs to run for a substantial amount of time is called. Calling this method synchronously could result in an inferior user experience when compared to if the same method was called asynchronously. This would, for example, be more apparent in a mobile application where there is potentially a rich user interface. So in this example, we are going to simulate the calling of a web service to download the contents of a document. Document sizes can vary, so if a document is particularly large, it is going to be far more performant to execute the downloading of the document content asynchronously. So I'll fast forward the creation of the calling client code in the main method. When a document is found in the data structure, its contents is downloaded asynchronously using a web service call and displayed to the console screen. The time that might be taken in a real world application by a web service call is simulated by forcing a six second delay in the code. Let's run the code. And the result is as expected. And what happens if we search for a document that does not exist in the binary search tree structure? You can see the ID is greater than the highest document ID of 7 that exists in the binary search tree data structure. So the nodes on the right side are traversed and finally null is returned because the document does not exist. Please download the code from GitHub and go through it at your own pace. I feel I needed to go through the examples fairly quickly in order to demonstrate as much as possible regarding C-sharp methods in a timely fashion. Note that in order to run the asynchronous code, make sure that you are using the latest minor version of C-sharp. At the time of writing this tutorial, version 7.3 is the latest minor version of the language. You can convert a project to use the latest minor version of the C-sharp language by following these steps. Right-click the relevant project node, then click the Project Context menu item, in the Build section, click the Advanced button and then select the C-Sharp latest minor version from the Language Version drop-down list. We have discussed what a method is and that in C-Sharp all instructions are performed in the context of a method. We discussed what method signatures are. A code example demonstrating overloaded methods was given. We saw through a code example how method overloading can be achieved in a class by implementing methods with the same name but with different method signatures. A code example was given demonstrating how a method can call itself recursively and how an appropriate base case must be implemented to prevent a stack overflow runtime error from being thrown. We looked at how the use of the generic IEnumerable interface coupled with the yield return keyword combination can be implemented on a method to enable the method to be called within a for each loop as if the method were a collection. Lastly, we saw how a method that could potentially block the main UI thread causing performance concerns for the user due to its implementation of time-consuming tasks could be alleviated by enabling a method to be invoked asynchronously. 
Please download the code demonstrated in this tutorial from GitHub so that you can go through it at your own pace. Details of where you can download the code are provided below in the description. If you feel you have gained value from viewing this tutorial, please give it a thumbs up and please subscribe to the channel. There's much more valuable content to come that can enhance your knowledge of programming and technology. Please smash the bell icon to be notified of future content which will be coming soon. Thank you and take care.